Hi guys and welcome back to my channel. This is episode two in the water cycle and water insecurity unit over here on my channel. Today we're going to be looking at the global hydrological cycle. I'll link the playlist up here. There's one previous episode, it was only really short, you can go ahead and watch it after this. Um, and I'm going to be going through the whole geography specification. I've already done a load of different topics over on my channel so you can go and find them in my playlist section if you would like. But yeah, without further ado, let's just get straight on into this video. Where is all the water? The amount of water available worldwide is finite. If a 4.5 litre jug represents all the water on Earth, a single tablespoon represents the available fresh water. Fresh water makes up just 2.5% of the water on Earth. NASA estimates that every drop of fresh water has been consumed at least once because water flows through a closed hydrological cycle. Solar energy causes water to evaporate from both sea and land, which then returns as precipitation. However, most fresh water is locked up as either ice or groundwater for anything from 1,000 to 10,000 years. The global hydrological cycle, a closed system. The total amount of water in the world does not change. The hydrological cycle is a closed system. No inputs occur from outside and nothing is lost. However, water's nature and form changes all the time. Two processes, solar energy and gravitational potential energy, drive the global hydrological cycle. More evaporation occurs as global climate warms, which increases moisture level in the atmosphere. This, in turn, then leads to increased condensation as air cools, and therefore increased precipitation. This explains why some places may experience increased cloud cover and precipitation as climate changes. Gravitational potential energy keeps water moving throughout the system in a sequence of inputs, outputs, stores and flows. At a global scale, the system is continuous, with outputs governing inputs because nothing is lost or gained. However, shifts in the world's climatic zones means that some stores are depleting, such as the ice in the polar regions and in mountain glaciers is melting without being replenished. In areas that are warming, ground surfaces dry out as evaporation increases. Global air circulation then takes this extra vapour to cooler areas where it condenses into clouds and precipitation. Global extremes. Solar energy is concentrated at the tropics, where much is absorbed by the sea. Evaporation from the sea produces high rainfall. 74% of the world's rainfall occurs at sea, mostly within the tropics. The rest is distributed unevenly, both spatially and in time. The seasonal monsoons and droughts of Africa and Asia contrast with the temperature climate of Northwest Europe. Different climatic regions vary in the size and nature of their inputs, transfers and flows of water. The polar and tropical rainforest regions provide clear examples of how different hydrological processes compare. Let's talk for a second about polar hydrology. There are freeze-thaw seasonal differences. Winter snow insulates the ground and 85% of solar radiation is reflected. Permafrost creates impermeable surfaces. Lakes and rivers are frozen. Limited vegetation cover reduces heat absorption. The spring thaw causes rapid runoff. The summer thaw produces surface runoff, increasing evaporation tenfold. The freeze-thaw cycle causes the seasonal release of biogenic gas caused by plant deposition into the atmosphere, as well as carbon and nutrients into rivers and seas. It is characterised by orographic or frontal precipitation and low humidity. Annual precipitation here is less than 200 millimetres. The cryosphere, here, seasonal thaws bring increased surface saturation and thinning permafrost. If this thaw becomes continuous, water flows away and is lost, known as cryosphere loss. Okay, let's talk about tropical rainforest hydrology. There are a few seasonal differences. Dense vegetation intercepts and consumes up to 75% of precipitation. 50 to 75% of precipitation then returns by evapotranspiration. Evapotranspiration cools the air as energy is used during the process. Rainforests generate their own rain. Most is recycled within the tropics. Less than 25% of rainfall reaches rivers or other surface water. 
There is limited surface infiltration or groundwater and rainforests are cloud factories. Deforestation reduces evaporation, in turn reducing vapour and local rainfall. There are constant high temperatures and it is characterised by convectional rainfall and high humidity. The annual precipitation here is over 2,000 millimetres a year. Tropical rainforests. Here, permanently dense forests produce high rates of evapotranspiration, with water returning to the surface as, preci as precipitation that feeds large rivers such as the Amazon. Global stores and flows. Life depends on fresh water. Most of it is locked up in the cryosphere, in glaciers and ice sheets, or below the surface as groundwater. Less than 0.4% of fresh water is contained within surface lakes, rivers, the biosphere and the atmosphere at any one time. And much of that is transferred globally by flows known as fluxes. These fluxes vary within the season and the temperature, and the variation is known as annual fluxes. The global water budget. Oceans lose more water through evaporation than they gain through precipitation. Whereas the opposite is true of land masses. Surface runoff makes up the difference, known as balance. If this balance were disturbed, the oceans would receive more water and the continents would dry. The balance is known as the water budget, and it ensures that this does not happen. Water does not stay in the atmosphere for long. Its resistance time is short because of the yearly flux of 460,000 kilometers cubed, the ocean's atmosphere plus land to atmosphere. It's almost 35 times greater than the amount of water in the atmosphere can hold at any one time. Water resides in oceans for longer periods. The oceans are 3,000 times bigger than either the annual flux to or from the atmosphere or from the land. The importance of the tropics. The steep angle of the sun over the tropical oceans allows intense solar radiation, causing evaporation. Trade winds transfer water vapour towards the, the intertropical convergence zone, the ITCZ. There, strong convectional currents lift the air so that it cools and condenses into clouds, causing heavy rainstorms. Most of the world's rainfall is created in the ITCZ. This is the biggest flux, transferring water from oceans to land. The ITCZ is a wide belt of clouds within the tropics. These huge atmospheric flows of moisture are called tropospheric rivers. The importance of the polar regions. About two thirds of the Earth's fresh water is locked up in the cryosphere, places where the temperature remains below freezing for much of the year, such as ice sheets and glaciers. However, the global climate continues to warm. Some of the frozen cryosphere is returned by melting to flow into the sea, adding to the closed hydrological cycle. The polar regions contribute to the circulation of water and transfer of heat around the world which drive the global hydrological cycle. An ocean circulation occurs, known as the thermaline circulation, sometimes called the global conveyor belt. How does this work? How does the thermaline circulation work? Ocean water in the polar regions is, is colder, more saline, salty, and denser than the tropics, and so it sinks. The cold sinking water draws in warmer, warmer water from the ocean surface above, which in turn draws water across the surface from the tropics. The movement of water from the tropics draws up cold water from the ocean bottom to be warmed again. Fossil water. Untapped ancient stores of fresh water exist in the polar region and beneath many deserts. New technologies now make it possible to access these water stores, known as aquifers, beneath Greenland's ice sheet and under the Kenyan desert. For example, Kenya's Lotopia aquifer contains an estimated 200 billion cubic metres of fresh water. That's 70 years supply at Kenya's current rate of use, even without the natural replenishment that it receives from mountain streams. And that is the end of the second episode of the series. I hope you learned something. I hope you can take something away from it. Please do subscribe down below as I'll be uploading the next one next week. I will see you same time, same place next week, Monday, 4.30pm. Bye guys.